Good morning, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Please, can someone just maybe um, signify or let me know if you can hear me? Yeah, you are hurt. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is our first webinar for the year 2023. We're happy that um, you could find time in your busy schedule to join us today. Um, we have a very interesting topic that we'll be discussing that we'll be discussing today, statistical methods for medical physicists, and this will be delivered by Mr. Okungboa Enosakare. He's a lecturer, he's a medical physicist, and he lectures at the Department of um, Radiography, University of Benin. So I'm just quickly going to read this um, biography and Okay, before I read this biography, uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the president of our great association, Professor um, Balogun. He's here with us this morning. And um, I'm sure he has a word or two to say to us before we continue. Prof, sir, can you unmute yourself? Thank you very much, my dear secretary. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to the first uh, uh, webinar uh, by the association, and I hope that you have a lot to gain, especially for those of us that are in the academics and uh, the people in the clinical that are academically also academically also I mean involved. I wish you all the best as we go through the uh, program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, well done. Yes, we also have our, our other escorts um, with us. I can see the PRO, mm -hmm. Mr. Obina, and um, every member of the association. You're all welcome. Thank you very much. So quickly, I'll read um, Mr. Okungboa's biography so that we can go straight to the presentation. So um, Mr. Okungboa received his undergraduate training in industrial physics from the University of Benin. And he holds a master's degree in biophysics and an MPhil in medical physics, also from the University of Benin. He currently lectures in the Department of Radiography, School of Basic Medical Sciences, University of Benin, Nigeria. He's a PhD student currently working on predicting treatment outcomes from machine and dosimetric factors using machine learning algorithms. His other research areas are in the field of radiobiological modeling and data analytics. He has over 15 years experience in statistical data analysis and he has built expert skills in the use of statistical software such as SPSS, Data, GraphPad, Prism, and R. So this is who will be uh, speaking with us today. I'm sure he has a lot of um, experiences to share with us. And as I earlier mentioned, this is a topic that will be of benefit to every one of us. So thank you once again for joining us. And I'm going to hand over to Mr. Okungwa for his presentation. So you have approximately 40 minutes after which we'll take questions and answers. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you for accepting our invitation on behalf of NAMP. So Mr. Okungwa, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, okay. yes, okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, 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 we can, thank you. Okay. So uh, I want to appreciate the ESCOs of NAM for this opportunity to present this topic, statistical methods in medical physics. I'll start by looking at the, we'll be looking at uh, under the outline, basic statistical technologies, different statistical analysis and, and choice of statistical analysis, when to use a particular test and when not to use a particular test. And also, I'll be sharing some of my experiences in using statistics in the field of medical physics, some of my publications that I've done, and also introducing a bit of my PhD work in the frontier. Statistics is a field of study that deals with uh, the collection, organization, summarization, and analysis of the data, and also drawing inference from that body of data. As medical physicists, I, I don't think there's any day that we don't, in the clinical, we don't generate one or two data. So as much as we gather this data, it's most of the times it just ends in just in the case note in the file there. 
So this webinar, or this topic today will be very relevant to us. That's all the data that we gather as medical physicists. We can see how we can, after collecting them, organize them, summarize them, analyze them, and draw inference from the body of data that we collected. We know that um, the raw data that we have, the raw material for statistics is data. It is one thing to have a data set, either small or large. But the beauty is how we can generate relevant information for descriptive and inferential purpose. I'll be explaining these two terms later. Data sources. Data sources can either be from routinely kept records, case files, retrospective studies that um, we can pull information from. So if you have a center that has been on for let's say five years, you can pull records from there and analyze the records and publish it. That brings a linkage between those of us that are academics and those that are clinical. We synergize together to be able to produce paper and every paper that is published is not just for publication sake, but it will help the profession and also give us visibility in the space. Also, we have uh, other method of collecting data. We have survey method. Uh, one of the studies that I've done in that routine is um, was published in Bonu Medical Journal where we pulled records from breast cancer patients in UBTHA and were analyzed to look at their demographic characteristics as well as their clinical profile. Then also there's a survey study, you can do survey study where you issue questionnaire, ask patients how they felt on that. I've also done a study on that. Then there's experimental study. That's another way to source for information. In the experimental study, we tend to want to see, okay, if you use a particular treatment modality or use another treatment modality, is there a difference in the outcome? For example, there's a study that we did also to look at, uh, I'm gonna share it later, um, patients that took use lotion, a particular Levera lotion after or during the course of therapy and those that didn't use to see whether the complication or the side effect as a result of radiotherapy was reduced in those that use the lotion and those that didn't use the lotion. Also, you can also get data from external sources, repository online. There are different um, types of data that we have when we go to um, talk about medical physics and we'll talk about statistics. And this data, most of the times, we call them variable. If something is a, is a variable, means that it will change after, after each time. Each possession will have different values. If I'm doing a study to look at the knowledge of medical physicists about statistics, I don't need to have a variable called med, um, profession because everybody in that particular study, they are medical physicists. If I'm doing a study among women with breast cancer, they don't need to be a variable called sex. That's a constant. But if you're talking about age, something that will change over time, we we'll call it the variable. So there are two main types of variable, quantitative variable and qualitative variable. Quantitative variable is variable that can be quantified, that can be measured, quantified or measured. And most times it is in continuous form or in count form. Continuous form, age is continuous form. In count form, the number of patients that came for treatment, 10 patients, 20 patients, the number of uh, fracture that the patient took, that's a count form. So those are quantitative variables. They will have qualitative variables which tend to describe the variable. Example is outcome of a diagnosis, ethnic group, gender. This just only give attributes about particular variable on that discourse. And most times we call them nominal variable. They can either be in nominal form or ordinal form. But the nominal form, we can have nominal that are bimodial, binomial, where it has two outcomes, and we have multinomial, where it has more than two outcomes. Also, for qualitative variable, we have what we call ordinal variable, which takes order. Let's say cancer staging, stage one, stage two, stage three. Other classification, we have what we call dependent variable and independent variable. But the dependent variable can also be called outcome variable or called response variable. 
The independent variable is what we call variables that help to predict an outcome. Other, other um, literature we use the word explanatory variable. If there's a particular outcome as a result of therapy, what variables could you to explain that outcome? So we call them explanatory, predictors, independent variable, why some of our colleagues in the medical field would call it risk factors to a particular outcome. So now we'll go to the next part of the outline is uh, uh, the different kinds of basic statistical analysis. These are just basic, there are others that are still advanced, but this is just basic. We have what we call descriptive and inferential. Descriptive just describes the, the data set. What is the mean, the median, the standard division, standard error, the interquartile ring, the skewness, courtesies, and other coefficient of variation, and other kind of descriptive analysis, statistical analysis that is done for your data set to describe. You have different um, doses that you are giving. No, I know about doses. It. Right. We need to be able to get the mean. Let's, again, let's know what is the mean dose over time, which is like the average of the different doses. Then the median, later I'm going to explain to us our uh, parametric and non parametric distribution, where data follows a normal distribution or it doesn't follow normal distribution. So the rule of thumb is if the data is not normally distributed, the best descriptive statistics to use is the mean. But if it is uh, if it's not normally distributed, use the median. And the measure of spread that you use is the interquartile ring. But the data is normally distributed. The parametric descriptive is the mean and standard error. Then for inferential, we have regression to be able to look at how certain predictors can affect an outcome. There are a lot of type of regression, but the one that is popular is linear regression, logistic regression. But there are other regression we can talk about. We can talk about Poisson regression, talk about the ordinary regression, quite a lot of them that looks at the distributional behavior of the outcome variable. Then we have chi-square, which is a measure of association between two categorical variables. Then we have analysis of variance, which is used to compare mean of more than two uh, levels of the predicting variable. Then we'll talk about t-test, where you have just two comparisons. If you are looking at, you want to compare the mean dose among patients with type two, or stage two, and the mean dose given to patient with stage three. That's just two categories. You can use the T-test. If you have a particular uh, method that you use, let's say IMRT and a different method to treat patient, you want to now compare, or maybe in planning, use a particular method to plan, and use another method to plan. You want to compare just two methods. You can use a T-test to compare, depending on what you are trying to measure, the outcome variable. They will talk also about the Man Whitney and the cross Cavallis. These are non-parametric version of the ANOVA and the T-test. And then time we are looking at inferential, we talk about hypothesis. We want to look at at what level do we accept that this difference exists. Two people may be black, but there may be a slight difference, which is what we call in statistics by chance. The difference in their color may just be by chance, but in statistics, we give authority to uh, differences in in an outcome based on either at 95% or, or at 99% or almost 100% confidence assurance to say that there is a statistical significant difference or a significant association. So that will look at the P less than 0 0.05, which is 95%, P less than 0 0.01, which is 99%, and the P less than 0 0.001. So in the hypothesis, most of the time we stated in two main forms. <clears throat> There's no significant relationship or association. Relationship when the two variables we are comparing are continuous variables. But if the variables are not continuous, both of them are categorical, we'll talk about association between the variables. So every test statistic or inferential that we're looking at can either be a relationship test or a comparison test where you are comparing a group A and a group B. This was the study I was telling us the other time, where we have um, those that use aloe vera and those that didn't use aloe vera, we compare to look at if there was significant difference in the side effect. So as I said before, we are looking at either a test of difference or a test of relationship. 
relationship will look at if the amount of dose that you are giving to a patient is higher, will it lead to, let's say, an increase in the uh, uh, normal tissue communication probability, or it will lead to a reduction in it, which is one of our studies we did. That's a relationship test where we look at if a particular variable, your predictor, will increase an outcome. We'll talk about positive correlation, or if an increase will lead to a reduction in an outcome. We'll talk about a negative relationship. So I tried to explain to us before parametric statistics and non-parametric statistics that we will encounter in our data set, especially when we're looking at data that are continuous. Data that are continuous. So if the data is continuous, check the normality of the data. We'll plot a normality curve to check it, though there are other uh, test statistics that can also be used aside the normality curve. Because certain times, when you plot your normality curve, it tends to look as if it's normal with the eye, but uh, sometimes it looks a bit skewed. But there are two main tests that is also used, that are used. We have the komogoro smirnov test and the shakula wick test that can be used to check for normality of your data. So the data follows normal distribution, then your choice of statistical test should be a parametric statistical test. But if the data does not follow normality distribution, if it fails that test, then we can now use the non-parametric equivalent of the test statistics. But I try to give you a table, which is a kind of a summary of the different kinds of statistical tests that we encounter in the field of statistics and also in medical physics. Uh, we can have a chi-squared test. The first one is chi-squared test, where you have two categorical variables. The categorical variable can be of two or more levels. What we'll talk about level is, if you're looking at sex or gender, gender has two levels, male and female. Marital status can have more than one level. Disease staging can have more than one level. So when we're looking at disease staging and the particular outcome as a result of the treatment, that is an association. But the outcome can be categorical, either there was complication or no complication, or maybe the patient died or didn't die. chi square can help us to do such tests. At certain times, so we want to look at the us ratio to look at which population in the different level is more likely to have that outcome. That's what we call the us ratio. It will tell us the population that are more likely to have an outcome or less likely to have an outcome. We also have logistic regression. If we can get certain variables that are predictive of a particular outcome, a particular treatment outcome, we can have different uh, predictors or different explanatory variables. We need to now look at when we bring all these variables together, we need to synergize them to see interactively how they can also lead to an outcome variable. For logistic, we can have either the binary, where you have just two outcomes, or the multinomial or ordinal. Then the second type of outcome variable is when you have an outcome variable that is categorical and the explanatory variable is continuous. In such a case, we talk about ROC, the receiver operating characteristics curve, is a very important um, uh, test statistics that we use. Also, it's also very important in the field of machine learning, where you want to see how we can also use it also to get certain cutoff to know at, at what particular cutoff can one give a, a value to say at this cutoff, there is a, um, a risk factor to have a particular condition or not to have a particular condition. Then we have survival analysis to look at deaths and outcomes in terms of death or survival. Then when you have a, a categorical and continuous, because of um, they are not really of the same scale, we normally use PMN correlation to check. We have PMN, we have PS, piercing correlation coefficient to check for relationship between these two variables. But where we have cat continuous, the third one is continuous and categorical. We, if, if it is binary explanatory variable, let's say uh, you have two treatment group, treatment A and treatment B, then we use the independent T test. But if the categories are more than two, three or more, you use analysis of variance. But if these two fail, the, the, the test of the continuous, if you test the continuous variable, whether it is normally distributed or not, if it's not normally distributed, there is a non-parametric equivalent of the t-test. 
which is a Malwede test, I stated before, and a non-parametric version of the ANOVA, which is the uh, Kroskawalis. These are the two tests here, Malwede and Kroskawalis. Therefore, continuous, continuous, we look at regression and PSA in correlation. These are other forms of um, outcome variable that we can have an explanatory variable. We have multiple regression, two we analysis of variance. In one we analysis of variance, you just have one explanatory variable. But when you now need to have more than one explanatory or predictive variable or independent variable, we call it two way ANOVA. Then we also have where you have a continuous and a categorical. And then um, one of the one categorical variable has two or more levels. We we'll talk about analysis of covariance. This one I will call it ANCOVA. Then for certain study, we can talk about repeated measure. Repeated measure is the same patient. Let's say um, those of us that came, registered into this webinar today, before now, I checked the level of knowledge of statistics that medical physicists have. Then after, and I took a score of those persons before they started, and I took a score of this very set of medical physicists that came for this webinar today. After the webinar, we have been exposed to a particular treatment. In this case, we have been exposed to a training. After this webinar, we have been trained. We will now check again the same set of questions asked the, the, the participant in, this, in the program and also take their score. So comparing their score before the program and after the program, this is what we call repeated analysis, repeated analysis or paired analysis. So if it's just two time point measurements, we can use what we call a paired t-test. But when we have different time points of assessment, we use a repeated measure analysis of variance. Let's say a patient came two weeks after follow-up, one month after follow-up, six months after follow-up, these are different times. So you are measuring the same outcome variable in the patient. Such analysis are used there as a medical physicist. If you are taking certain outcome variable, is a repeated measure analysis of variance. Then where you do not have an outcome variable, all you have are just explanatory variables, a set of explanatory variables that many a time, I think we have things like that in our DVH. A lot of variables are in our DVH that we have, or a lot of variables that are measured that they are all explanatory variables. We can summarize this set of variables together using a method called principal component analysis. It is a, it's a kind of statistical tool that helps to do a called dimension reduction. It will reduce the number of explanatory variables. The ones that seem to be similar in behavior, it will cluster them in a particular principal component. All the ones that are similar will cluster them. So where you have up to let's say 32 sets of explanatory variables explaining, explaining an outcome, it can help you summarize them into, let's say, three pieces, principal components. So the, those two principal components that you cannot enter into a regression model, which one of the, the benefits of it is like to reduce the number of degree of freedom. Because when you have too many variables in your regression, the degree of freedom will be increased and tend to cause more errors. But when you do the principle of principal component analysis, it will reduce the number of variables you are entering into your regression model and gives better uh, prediction. I just want to just show us some of the studies that I have done and the um, results that we got using statistical analysis, some basic statistical tests that we did. One of such study is uh, one of my MFU work, radiobiological estimation of radiation induced heart complication of post mastectomy radiation therapy patient using a, a, a modeling method, a radiological model, the relative serialty model. That was done by myself and an oncologist in UBTH. And if you can see here now, we have a, this study was published in West African Journal of Radiology. We have a, a histogram plot trying to check the normality of the data. If you look at this data, it doesn't look normal. Every, this other part of it is kind of, Flatten out here is not symmetric. The um, normal tissue complication probability that was computed using the relative serialty model was not normally distributed. Also, the equivalent uniform dose that was captured from the DVH was also not normally distributed. So, the analysis that we use in this study were mainly non parametric, not parametric 
article two. We also did a bus plot to be able to check the equivalent equivalent controls in the right and the left breast. So we discovered that the dose to the left breast is higher than the, that of the right breast. And also we saw that the communication probability in the left is also higher, but though it's still very, very low, but comparison. Also what this plot, this bus plot shows, uh, it has five main components. It's a whisker plot. In the first part that we, ha we have uh, the minimum value, the maximum value, then we have the median. This thick black liner is the median, while this other two, they are the interquartile. This is the uh, lower quartile. This is the upper quartile, which is the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile. And this middle thick line is the median, which is the 50th percentile. Why the whiskers are showing the minimum value and the maximum value? So it carries five information. So this is something that uh, we can put in our, in our paper who are publishing and to gain access into high impact journal. Another study again that we did was to look at, uh, uh, this time also look at radiobiological model was done, I did it with my supervisor, Professor Sao. We had to look at the volume, the volume as a function of the equivalent uniform dose. And we saw that there was a negative correlation between it between the volume and the equivalent uniform dose, which is also shown in the, in the regression analysis that is captured here. The outcome rate, which I as aware as this, is the equivalent uniform dose, that if the volume is larger, will it lead to more dose being given and show that there's a negative relationship associated with that. But though it is not statistically significant because the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, also too for the part. And this is also the table, one of the tables in the study. And it's, um, showing us different DVH parameter. So the heart, in the, in the heart, we have the maximum dose as a, as a function, as it affects the normal tissue communication probability. So they're saying that higher dose will lead to higher NTCP. This is using the LKB model, and also higher maximum dose will also lead to higher um, NTCP using the relative seriality model. So these are the things that we got. However, it, this is also significant here, this is significant here, but this is not significant. The ones carrying stars are the ones that are statistically significant. Statistical significant means that if the the uh, relationship you are establishing or the difference you are establishing, it is something that really exists or it is due to chance. And this is the study that would be the comparison between those that used uh, treatment that, that used uh, the aloe vera and those that didn't use the aloe vera was published in Tropical Journal of Natural Research. And uh, this is the, the finding. These are the different grading of the side effects the different gradients. And this first group here are those that, um, group A, I think group A are those that use the aloe vera, yes. Group A is the aloe vera group, while group B is those without aloe vera. So we discover uh, it, most of the patients didn't have complication, they were grade zero. Compared to where we have for the group B, we still have quite a lot of them having grade two and grade three side effects. And this association between this categorical and categorical variable was tested in chi school and it was statistically significant. And also there's another study that we published. We also use statistical uh, analysis for this secondary uh, complication probability after therapy. And we, there are three main methods, the models, the linear model, the linear exponent model, and the linear plateau model which we try to look at different, uh, different mean dose. We try to group the mean dose for those that took mean dose less than five. This mean dose is the mean dose from the DVH parameter. Then those that have mean dose five to 10, and those that have mean dose above 10 gray. For the linear uh, model, for the SSCP, the medium model showed that there was statistical significance. This was done using analysis of variance. I showed that there was a significant difference 
But for the linear exponent, there was no statistical significant difference. We see this is 0 0.39, 0 0.32, and 0 0.32. There was no difference. Um, the 0 0.39 and 0 0.32, the difference that is occurring of 0 0.07 is due to chance statistically. While for the linear plate 2 model, there was also statistical significant difference, but the P was less than 0 0.01. However, though uh, it was yesterday I was preparing, I discovered that this uh, statement here was not actually, was actually extracted by the editor. Normally, there's supposed to be a superscript on this to show the post hoc. If we have statistical significant difference, we normally do what we call the post hoc to check between which groups were the difference observed. If you look at this now for this. Linear play two model is called this is one point, this is one point. Definitely, these two will not have significant difference. The difference will be as a result of the less than five gray and the above 10 gray and the 1.86 and the 2.49. The same thing too was also done for the, the lungs. Another statistical test we did was uh, looking at the effect of cell phone. This is now uh, no yeah. radiation, no radiation, using it to check association between excess phone usage and the risk of uh, male infertility. So male um, component was, uh, the component of the male, if we checked for male infertility, that was a study that was done. And certain parameters were collected, uh, seminar parameters, and some of them reported had, had abnormal, so had normal. I'll try to check those that have abnormal, and they just, it was actually a subjective question whether uh, to check if they put their phone in their pocket and the number of ways they use their phone. And many of them will describe from the questionnaire. There's a questionnaire that you look at cell phone overuse. And we gave a cutoff to be able to generate those that are overusing cell phone and those that are not overusing it to see if there is a correlation between, here's an association between excessive use of cell phone and those patients that their seminar fluid had abnormal. And we saw that there was a statistical significant association. And uh, those that use, this is those that use, and the prevalence of abnormal seminar technical is higher in this group than the normal group. Also, we compared the, the mean of their seminar parameters for those that have excessive use and those that don't have. And in most of them, we saw that there was statistical significant. You see, for those, the, the, the spend count for those that had excessive usage of phone is lower than those that, over, that do not overuse their phone. In all the parameters, it was revealed that way. Then in conclusion, looking ahead, presently I'm working on uh, trying to develop a set of machine learning algorithms that will help in predicting radiotherapy treatment outcome using clinical parameters and also dosimetric or machine parameters. These are, are my predictors. My dependent variable is going to be uh, two phase. We're looking at those that patient that may uh, may have a side effect as a result of therapy when they come for follow up, and maybe those that died or those that didn't die as a result of the, the, the diagnosis that they came to the hospital to see what could be responsible. So we'll look at clinical predictors. Could it be as a result of previous family history of cancer? Uh, could it be as a result of their lifestyle, smoking or drinking? Could it be as a result of the staging that caused about the, um, the side effects? Or could it be from the dosimetric um, parameters that were used in treating the patient? So these are some of the things we want to look at in that study we're looking at. And also it's gonna be a classifier algorithm for those of us that are familiar with machine learning. We have machine learning that uh, is also part of data analytic. There's those that are for regression and those that are for classification. But the lens machine learning that we'll be using is for classification to look at classifier models, algorithms that can be used for assessing our outcome variables to know which of these variables have more importance in predicting the outcomes. These are something that uh, normally uh, regression analysis can do, but machine learning tends to do better in achieving our aim. And one thing that machine learning can do is we can have a, a training set and a test set. So we train the model and see the behavior of the model. After seeing the behavior of the model, we'll try to validate it using a set of tests 
models, test data sets, we want to now get, if we want to get a very good accuracy or get a very good uh, prediction from uh, different algorithms that we'll be using. Thank you very much for your time.